This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my video streaming service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. We've all heard of climate change. Greta has told us about it, David Attenborough has forced us to watch walruses die, ice caps are melting, Australia is burning, it's been intense. The vast majority of scientists now believe that human industries are transforming our climate. Looking at the headlines, you'd think climate change snuck up on us out of nowhere. Surely we've only known about greenhouse gases for a few decades, at the most. Yeah, Exxon knew about the effects fossil fuels were having on the climate back in the 70s and did their best to suppress it, but surely it couldn't go much further back than that, could it? Yeah, try about 200 years. Cognito is more of a humanities type channel and not a science type channel, so any science explained in this video is simplified and is explained to the best of my understanding. I'm not a scientist, nor am I a warlock. If I make any mistakes, please point them out in the comments and I will address them. Climate change is happening for a number of different reasons, but the main culprit is greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, emitted from the burning of fossil fuels like coal and oil. So what exactly is a greenhouse gas and how do they affect the climate? This is our planet and this is the sun. The sun shoots energy towards Earth as visible light, and these solar rays can easily pass through the gases in our atmosphere. The Earth absorbs some of these rays, heats up, and then emits them as thermal radiation, otherwise known as heat. This radiation, however, can be absorbed by certain gases in our atmosphere. So some of this heat goes back down towards Earth and warms it. This forms a kind of greenhouse-like heat-trapping barrier around the Earth. The more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more heat gets trapped. Since the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide levels have risen more than 38% and our constant desire for more and more land has, unfortunately, caused us to chop down massive amounts of carbon-absorbing forests. But don't let the existential dread set in. Don't let the existential dread set in. The first human person to theorise something like the greenhouse effect was Joseph Furrier. This clever Frenchman was trying to figure out why the Earth wasn't a frozen wasteland. He calculated how much energy the sun bombarded the Earth with and realised that it should be much colder than it actually is. Something must have been trapping the sun's heat. In an 1824 paper, he hypothesised heat in the state of light finds less resistance in penetrating the air than in repassing into the air when converted into non-luminous heat. This was a pretty good description of the greenhouse effect, and it was made by a person old enough to have been friends with Napoleon. Furrier never actually used the term greenhouse. He didn't even conduct an experiment to test his hypothesis, nor could he even pinpoint which gas could cause this effect. That answer would come from the most unlikely of creatures. A hobbit. No, it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a hobbit. You're trying to tell me that someone called Eunice Newton Foote isn't a hobbit. Okay, whatever, I guess. Foote was a woman, however, so in the eyes of 19th century scientists, her opinion was about as relevant as a hobbit's anyway, which we will unfortunately see shortly. Having made the awful decision to be born a woman in 19th century America, Foote didn't have much hope of becoming a scientist, as women weren't offered much scientific education at the time. But she did enjoy science and had a curious mind, so she conducted her own amateur scientific experiments. Eunice wanted to know how gases interacted with the sun's light, so she conducted an experiment. She placed thermometers inside of glass cylinders and then added different amounts of gas and varying amounts of moisture into them using an air pump. She then placed the cylinders out in the sun and measured their temperature differences over time. She tested gases such as water vapour, common air, and carbon dioxide. She noticed that the cylinders filled with carbon dioxide or water vapour heated up quicker and remained hot longer. From this she speculated that an atmosphere of carbon dioxide would give our Earth a high temperature, and if, as some suppose, at one point of its history the air had mixed with a larger proportion than at present, an increased temperature must have necessarily resulted. Her paper was presented by a male scientist on her behalf at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1856. 
and published in the American Journal of Arts and Science under the catchy title, Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays. Foote had built on Fourier's idea, but she actually tested it and discovered that carbon dioxide was one of the greenhouse gases that trapped heat in our atmosphere. She correctly hypothesized that changing the levels of carbon dioxide would change the Earth's temperature, which laid the foundation of modern climate science. But no one paid attention to her work. No one saw how significant of a hypothesis this was. Eunice simply became a footnote in climate history. Instead, the credit for the discovery of the greenhouse effect and greenhouse gases is given to Irish scientist John Tyndall. Tyndall was obsessed with a question that dominated Victorian era science, the Ice Age theory. It had recently been discovered that large parts of the Earth were once covered with ice, and scientists were fascinated with answering what had caused the Ice Ages, which apparently there are five of. How do they, how do they rope Patrick Stewart into this? Name, Aristotle, From Scratlantis. Okay. Fur is greyish brown, apparently. That's, that's nice. Where were we? There were a few theories floating about on what could have caused these ice ages. The first and most obvious was frost giants. But Tyndall, like Furrier and Foote before him, thought that maybe the atmosphere could be responsible. To test whether or not gases could trap heat, Tyndall built this insane looking thing, which is actually much simpler than it appears. Basically, heat is pushed through this tube and the tube is filled with the gas being tested. The heat leaves the tube through the other end, hits this cone, and the heat level is compared against the heat hitting the control cone from the other side. Using this heat difference between the cones, Tyndall could calculate how much heat the gas in the tube had absorbed. He published his results in another spicily named paper, on the absorption and radiation of heat by gases and vapors, and on the physical connection of radiation, absorption, and conduction. His results showed that water vapor and carbon dioxide, along with some other gases, were the primary heat absorbers. He found that carbon dioxide could trap 1,000 times more heat than common air. The solar heat possesses in a far higher degree than that of limelight the power of crossing the atmosphere. But when the heat is absorbed by the planet, it is so changed in quality that the rays emanating from the planet cannot get with the same freedom back into space. Thus, the atmosphere admits of the entrance of the solar heat but checks its exit, and the result is a tendency to accumulate heat at the surface of the planet. Tyndall had perfectly described the greenhouse effect and proven it with his cones, which is why he is normally credited with discovering it. His experiment revealed what Foote had discovered three years before. But in Tyndall's later writings, he claims, With regard to the action of other gases upon heat, we are not, so far as I am aware, possessed of a single experiment. One could argue Tyndall must have seen Foote's work, since the journal that carried Foote's paper also carried a paper by Tyndall on colorblindness. If Tyndall went to go look at his own published paper, he could easily have seen Foots. We'll unfortunately never know whether or not he saw her paper before conducting his experiment. But Tyndall's experiment did correct some problems with Eunice's, by being able to isolate heat radiation, for example, which isn't really surprising considering his advanced scientific education. And so, his experiment has been much more influential in the field of climate science than hers. But Eunice's great idea, in the end, wasn't her experiment. It was her hypothesis that changes in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could alter our planet's temperature. And as far as I know, she was the first person to think this. This was 150 years ago. This is pre-American Civil War. Who knows what she could have accomplished had she had Tyndall's advantages. The final piece of the climate change puzzle was put together by Swedish physicist Svante Thunberg Arrhenius in 1896, who is probably the first person to predict that human industry could severely affect the climate. And yes, this Svante Thunberg Arrhenius is related to Svante Thunberg, father of Greta Thunberg. I guess that family just has a knack for climate stuff. Like Thindel, Arrhenius was also interested 
in the Ice Age debate. He liked Thindle's idea that changes in the atmosphere like decreased carbon dioxide levels could have caused ice ages. So he wanted to calculate just how much of a change in carbon dioxide levels it would take to alter the climate. Luckily for him, Swedish scientist Arvid Hogboom had recently published an essay estimating just how much carbon dioxide was in the Earth's atmosphere throughout history. With this information at hand, Arrhenius began calculating how much heat would be trapped if carbon dioxide levels changed. Arrhenius did tens of thousands of calculations all by hand, without a calculator. Doing this, he discovered that cutting the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by half would lower the temperature in Europe some 4 to 5 degrees Celsius, which is an ice age level. This explained how the Earth might have cooled in the past, but it sparked another idea for Arrhenius. Could this make the Earth heat up? Now, Arvid Hogboom, in his calculations on how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere throughout history, included things like emissions from volcanoes. But he also had the great idea to include emissions from human industry, like factories. Looking at this, Arrhenius realized that if you doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it would raise the world's temperature by 5 to 6 degrees Celsius. And that if humanity continued to burn fossil fuels and pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we could trigger this rise in temperature. Which is pretty close to modern predictions that cost millions of dollars and that are calculated on supercomputers. Arrhenius was the first person to predict that burning fossil fuels could trigger global warming. But for Arrhenius, all of this was simply hypothetical. He didn't imagine we could ever manage to burn enough fossil fuels to ever seriously impact the climate. Arrhenius predicted that climate change would happen eventually, but he thought it would take 3,000 years for global carbon dioxide levels to raise by 50%. They've shot up by about 30% in the last 100. But don't let the existential dread set in. Don't let the existential dread set in. Don't let the existential dread set in. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, we're fine. Anyway, temperature increase probably didn't sound too bad to these Swedish scientists. Some scientists, like Walter Nurst, even thought about burning more coal for no reason other than to release more carbon dioxide to purposefully heat up the earth. Come on, Walter. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Jesus. Arrhenius even liked the idea of global warming. By the influence of the increasing percentage of carbonic acid in the atmosphere, we may hope to enjoy ages with more equable and better climates. They couldn't imagine the negative effects of climate change. The mass extinctions, the environmental destruction, the depressing David Attenborough documentaries. Seriously, I haven't been the same since the Wabra scene. It ruined my life. Climate change might seem like it came all of a sudden, if you judge by panicked tweets, depressing headlines, and global protests. But the science predicting it is very old. We just weren't really paying attention. This channel is all about paying attention to the world, learning about beliefs, peoples, and interesting topics. Recently, I've been paying attention to a bunch of David Attenborough documentaries, my favourite of which is David Attenborough's Light on Earth which is absolutely gorgeous and manages to turn nature into some sort of stunning light show. Honestly, put this up on a big screen in a dark room and just let it blow you away. And you can watch it over on CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a documentary streaming service that gives you access to thousands of documentaries like Light on Earth. They have documentaries featuring top names like David Attenborough and Stephen Hawking, including exclusive originals. You'll get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month and the first 31 days are completely free if you sign up over at curiositystream.com slash cogito and use the promo code cogito during the sign up process. And by signing up to CuriosityStream, you will be helping the YouTube educational community because CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform. So they're offering cogito viewers free access to Nebula when you sign up over at curiositystream.com slash cogito. Nebula is a video streaming platform I'm helping to build along with a bunch of other independent creators like The Great War, Sweeney and Our Changing Climate, along with a bunch of others. 
Nebula is a place where creators can upload content without having to worry about demonetization, and it even hosts original content like Real Engineering's Logistics of D-Day series, or Grand Test Auto by Second Thought and Real Life Lore, all ad-free and earlier than on YouTube. This video was up on Nebula days ago, so go over to curiositystream.com slash cogito and you'll get thousands of high quality documentaries and you'll be helping to support educational creators without having to sit through ads. It's incredible that CuriosityStream is supporting learning with this deal. So head over to curiositystream.com slash cogito and get access to CuriosityStream and Nebula today. I really hope you enjoyed this video. You can find all the sources used in the description. If you like this content, please subscribe and please leave your comments and feedback in the comments down below. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can head over to my Patreon or check out the Cogito store also in the description below. Thank you so much for watching.